So you're looking to advance your witchcraft, deepen into your practice, and everyone is always talking about the importance of meditation. But in practice, it just doesn't feel that simple. Between work, home, family life, stresses, anxieties, physical constraints, mental health conditions, the state of the world, and so much more. Finding time, finding energy, finding the motivation, and not beating yourself up. It's just really, really difficult when it gets down to it. It just feels like meditation isn't for you. You just long for a meditation practice that is gonna give you a sense of peace and calm and serenity and a deep, delicious feeling of just being present in the moment. And by the end of this video, I promise you, you're gonna be able to get there. So if you're interested to learn more about different techniques that you can tap into to support your meditative and breathwork practices, then get yourself a nice hot drink, settle back, relax, and enjoy. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope that you are well and safe and looking after yourselves. I thought it would be a lovely day to sit here and talk to you about some practices that I find really supportive for anxiety, depression, and deepening my connection in witchcraft and spiritual practices. I also want to provide a little bit of context. I would love to be able to make the most comprehensive videos, but I just know that's not possible. And I am not a historian. I am a practitioner of witchcraft. I work a lot with herbs. I'm interested in astrology and tarot. And my practice is fairly diverse and eclectic. I work primarily alone, but I do connect with others and work in some groups, in online spaces and in person. I work with some deities as well. And a lot of my practice also takes place on the astral. And in order to deepen my work in astral spaces, meditative practices are so, so important. For me, meditation and breath work has been a powerful um, and transformative experience since I was young because I was someone who suffered with anxiety from quite a young age really. I was only really diagnosed with it as a late teenager as well as some other mental health conditions and depression and then since having children, postnatal depression, OCD, anxiety. So I am no stranger to mental health conditions and for me when I was very young I was afraid of tests and exams and certain subjects like maths and science and in general just tests would be very very scary for me and you know I've had panic attacks and I've had heart palpitations all sorts of things like that over the years and meditation is something that I've always come back to and always coming back to the breath and it also is fundamental for a witch so that's where we're going to go with this video so if you are a witch and you're looking to deepen your practice but for you the idea of sitting still and focusing on nothing is just really really difficult well you can just forget all of that because that's not really what we're trying to do when we're meditating number one and also meditation it's not supposed to be something that you're perfect at it's a practice to help you to cultivate awareness and a mind-body connection, as well as in other areas of your life. So we're gonna go really from the beginning and we're gonna talk about some context, we're gonna talk about some techniques, we're gonna talk about where they've come from, and we're gonna talk about some things that I found useful. It's probably going to be quite a long one, so get yourself a drink if you haven't already, and let's just get into it. So there is this misconception in the society at large, I guess, and the general population, that meditation is hard, that you have to sit in a particular lotus position, you know, using certain hand mudras, and that you have to not be thinking about anything, that you have to be perfect at it, that you, you need to be able to lengthen your breath, and it all just needs to be perfect, and you need to be able to do it, and if you don't, then everyone ends up feeling rubbish about themselves, which is basically what every human is going to experience if they understand meditation to be that way but that is not actually what the goal is. The goal of meditation is actually the meditation practice itself. It's not that you're trying to switch your brain off or to halt or stop the monkey mind, it's actually just to learn to allow the thoughts to pass you by in a way that is kind of coming back to neutrality. So you are 
able to notice those things coming in and out because you will, your mind will wander, but as you practice, it will become easier. But then of course, you'll have periods of stress, times when life feels really challenging, where it'll be perhaps harder for you to get into that space. But that's why having a daily practice of even just five minutes is gonna be absolutely transformative. So when I was younger, I often did meditations when I was already in a state. What I learned over the years was just to practice more and more would enable me to be less likely to be in that state. So it's not like a, oh, I'm scared or I'm panicking, I'm gonna go do a half an hour meditation. It's I've done my five or 10 minutes or however long you have in the morning, or I'll come to some tips and tricks, you know, if the morning doesn't work for you later. But you know, you've done your little small amount of meditative breath work, and we'll come to breath work as well. And the day flows, even with the challenges, you know, it might feel feel really, really difficult still, but you might not be so reactive, you might not be so emotionally charged, and you're able to look at things more objectively, you're able to be slower, you're able to be more present and more mindful of what is happening in each moment. So really what meditation is, is a practice of training your mind to come back to neutrality when it wanders. And we do this a lot of times, a lot of meditations will focus on breath. And that's why breath work is so powerful. I mean, breath is life. You can't really have meditation without breath work. Breath work is inherent and intrinsic and so, so valuable. And of course you can have breath work without necessarily having a full on meditation. If you know you need to take a breath, just one, deep belly breath ooh, will allow you to come back to a state of neutrality. And if you can dip into that practice as regularly as possible of training your mind to come back to a place of neutrality and stillness, that is going to support you no end in life and with things like anxiety, depression, any mental health conditions, it's gonna help you to be able to focus on what you're doing day to day, so work and family life, and it's gonna help you to be calmer and more present, essentially. And then, not to mention the myriad of benefits that you get as a magical practitioner, as a witch. For me, the most obvious is the astral work because I do work on the astral and the more you can work with your breath, the more you can dip into these altered states of consciousness through meditation, through breath work, you're able to deepen into that and stay there longer and linger and really the world becomes much more immersive for you. But taking it way back to basics, just the act of centering, grounding, Recentering again is a meditative practice in itself. Cleansing, it is a meditative practice. If you are doing it with the intention and with the connection there, it is a meditative practice. This video has been so kindly sponsored by Aura. I have been using Aura for over a year and a half now and absolutely loving the beautiful meditations, the visualizations, the mindfulness practices all kinds of different content that you can tap into. So Aura is an award-winning app for mental wellness and sleep with over 5 million users. Aura partners with hundreds of experts globally and provides a highly personalized all-in-one library for mental wellness. So with Aura, you have access to thousands upon thousands of meditations and stories, cognitive behavioral therapy, life coaching, podcasts, soundscapes, visualizations, vibrational music, and so much more. I absolutely love Aura for supporting with sleep, prayer, for coaching and hypnosis, breath work, for different music, podcasts. There's also some psychic development courses and practices as well on the app and just some beautiful magical meditations to tap into. So whether you're a beginner, an intermediate or a veteran when it comes to mindfulness practices, breath work or meditation, there is something for you on Aura and there is so much to discover and explore. Click the link below in my description box for a free trial and 25% off your membership of the Aura app. 
So you might be a witch who thinks, oh, well, I don't really meditate. Well, actually, maybe you already do, because there are other ways to meditate that don't look like that either, that are walking meditations, you know, obviously not with your music in or, you know, looking at your phone, but if you are walking and taking in nature and breathing as you walk, and it is, you can get lost in it. You can even end up meditating when you're driving and things, because you go on kind of automatic pilot. Have you ever had that experience where, you're driving somewhere and you don't really remember how you got from A to B, that's because you slipped into a trance state, into an alpha's brainwave state, and you were able to switch off a little bit. And part of your brain was immersed in that and it was a meditative practice. I would not count that as meditation practice in itself, but it just goes to show how we do slip in and out of these brainwave states all the time in life, naturally anyway. Reading is another one. You know, if, for instance, things feel really, really difficult and really, really challenging, just having a beautiful novel or perhaps there's like a play or a non-fiction book or something that you use for bibliomancy or anything, book of Psalms, things that bring you back to a sense of neutrality and a text that you dip into a lot, something like that, you could pull open a page and start reading and allow yourself to just slip into a trance state. I notice it a lot when I'm reading novels and my mind slows down and I'm just in a much more peaceful state. This is really, really supportive for the body. I think it takes something like six or seven minutes of reading to sort of slip into a kind of altered state of consciousness. That's a really, really beautiful way to do it as well if you're struggling. You can also do this with any mindless activity that's repetitive. I used to do this a lot when I was younger and I was ironing for my mum. So there are so many different types of meditation and meditation itself is a practice that has been around for thousands of years. It can be traced back to ancient civilizations in India, in Greece, and in China. In everyday circles, it's considered to be a technique and practice for training attention and awareness, and I think it's there that the misconception comes that you have to have a clear mind all the time. But when you forget about that kind of misconception and notice how you can slip into it so easily, and you understand that that's not actually the goal of the meditation, it becomes a lot easier to see where you are actually already meditating and how you can tap into it breath work and certain techniques of meditation to get the benefits even more. So in ancient India around 1500 BC there are ancient Vedic texts that record meditative practices and it was utilized almost as prayer to connect with the divine. In the 6th century Buddhist monks would meditate to achieve enlightenment and of course with Buddhism comes a number of different types of meditation and meditative practices. In China, Taoist meditation was a lot about aligning the self to the natural rhythm of life. And in ancient Greek philosophy as well, there's a lot around self-reflection and inner work that is aligned with meditative practices too. Seventh century Zen Buddhism is really where the seated meditation comes in. And of course, in Hinduism, there's yoga. And that, of course, is a core practice and a form of meditation in itself. And yoga was said to be brought to the West by a yogi named Swami Vivekananda in 1883 but I've also read I believe that Alistair Crowley was instrumental in bringing yoga and yogic practices to the West also. We could go into yoga and that could be a whole video but we're not going to talk too much about that here. But yoga in itself was also part of the theosophical movement and new thought. Later in the 20th century, 1960s, 1970s, meditation became very very popular in popular culture. You know it was all the rage because that was the way life was. Everyone embraced all aspects of that lifestyle. Mindfulness in itself comes from John Kabat-Zinn who introduced mindfulness to the West in a meditative practice, so essentially for stress reduction. And of course there are other meditative practices that originate from diverse cultures and religions, including Tantra, Kundalini meditation and yoga, the chakra system, and a number of these of course have been somewhat co-opted and adopted by the West in typical New Age spiritual movements. I personally do love the chakra system. I don't tend to refer to them as chakras. Instead I will refer to them as the throat or the heart because they are spaces of power within the body. And then of course there are other models that are more culturally appropriate for someone like me that I can lean into as energy centers. There are practices such as shamanism which again also much like the chakras and other systems 
customs have been co-opted somewhat, which I believe originated in Siberia, the Sami peoples, but is often confused and conflated. And then of course the word is misused a lot and there's a lot of cultural appropriation with that. So it's something that is not exactly easy to understand. It's not easy to kind of source. So I would advise caution with that, but instead leaning into aesthetic practices, really. I think aesthetic practices or trance is a word that you could kind of use in place of something like shamanic because it still conveys the essence of what it is that we're doing when we lean into practices that are shamanic in nature. It is about slipping into trance states and we're aided in that pursuit via the use of meditative practices and tapping into breathwork and those spiritual aids. So just quickly, different types of meditations. Mindfulness meditation is extremely popular in all areas of society, I think, because it's something that with the rise of different mental health conditions and the rise in understanding around that, it's become very popular. Mindfulness is definitely a buzzword, but it is really, really important. And remembering that point about coming back to center, coming back to the present and neutrality as well. It's not necessarily about being like happy and content with everything, but it's just about sitting in what is in that moment and being okay with that or not being okay with that and being okay with not being okay with that which is hard to do I will say there's breath work which I'm talking about breath comes into all meditation of course but you can have breath specific meditation in which you are actually focusing on the breath as an anchor point and deepening into that breath and really allowing the length of your breath to lengthen and allow it to fill your body and really feeling following the breath as it travels around your body and you can tap into the breath and you utilize it to support you with practices such as centering and grounding and Reiki as well and Reiki is something that I have trained in and it's something that I love to do and I've talked about in other videos also if you would like to learn more about centering and grounding and those basic energetic practices I have videos on those as well so I will link them there are very very simple techniques such as body scans which I love you can imagine a beam of light coming down from the heavens which is what I always love to do and flowing through your body and it sort of checks or you could just go through every little part of you and check for any discomfort, any tightness. And you can also do a kind of gradual release technique in addition to the body scan where you clench and then release. I can't do it properly with my face and blah, blah, blah. But you know, so you clench and then release. You isolate certain parts of your body to do that. And that in a way is similar to a technique I love, which is yoga nidra. And yoga nidra is like sleep yoga. It's really beautiful. And you feel like you've had a whole night's sleep just with 20 minutes. It's absolutely gorgeous. And you can also quite easily astral project after practicing yoga nidra for a while as well it's really really beautiful and I love that it's similar because it's about isolating certain parts of the body until you're kind of like lifted out almost but yeah the breath again is so important in that and it pretty much always starts with that working with the heart center I always like to go into the heart center when I'm meditating and when I'm grounding and when I'm centering the heart center is a really really important space for me so it's kind of an everyday sort of step for me as part of my meditative practice but a kind of heart centered loving kindness meditation is really really popular to cultivate feelings of self-love and self-worth and really really important and profound and I think that that's again something that is tapped into a lot more in popular culture now because of the need for self-care and self-love and also that was such a buzzword as well wasn't it you know a number of years ago now but it still is I think so that kind of meditation practice is so so valuable and key I will say as well even though I started meditating when I was quite young it took me years to understand actually if I meditate more frequently for less time it's going to have a more profound and greater impact on me so if I'm able to dedicate those five minutes a day rather than just meditating when and everything feels like it's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> it's much easier. But also, even doing the meditations I did and the visualizations, I didn't count them as meditation because I wasn't sitting on a cushion holding this pose with my legs crossed. And in that pose, I didn't think it was meditation. And I remember when I was a teenager, there was a film I loved called Kissing Jessica Stein. It's such a funny 
funny film if you've never seen it. It was an independent film and it has some amazing actors in it. It was so good and self-written as well by the actors who played the main characters. I remember there's a section in it where the lead character is trying to meditate and she's just got a clock, a little clock next to her and she's just... She keeps opening like one eye to like check the clock. And I think I I did practice a bit like that when I was a teenager. I was like, is it time yet? <laughs> but forgetting, of course, like when I lie down on the bed and I have my meditation track for stress and anxiety, that is the meditation right there and not getting that it was the same thing. There's a lot of misconceptions around it. And, you know, just because as well, I've been doing it for a long time, I don't think I'm very good at it, to be honest with you. But I don't need to be good at it because the whole point is I'm doing it and it's helping me. I don't think I'm good at it because my mind wanders all the time, but I don't need to be good at it. You know, I'm doing it and that's enough and it feels really good. So I don't think it's something that someone needs to be really good at either. So I will just say that, I'll throw that out there, you know. I just think when it gets to a sweet spot, it can feel really delicious. When you slip into a trance state and then you journey, you go on the astral, you work in an astral temple or you have a beach that you go to or you have a woodland that you go to or you spiral down some wooden steps within a tree or you go up steps in a tree or you know you float up and then you find yourself in the clouds or you are on top of a pyramid or wherever you go it's there's this richness to it and you kind of drop and oh it's so beautiful yeah I love it there's also lots of different somatic exercises that you can do that will kind of mimic the sort of release and feeling of like slipping slightly into an altered state of consciousness. It's not exactly, it's more like a just sort of relaxation technique, but it helps you to sort of get the feel of that meditation practice without having to actually do that. So I would highly recommend that you look up somatic techniques. There's somatic breath work and then there's somatic exercises. And there's one that I absolutely love to do where you tilt your head like this and you look up that way and you hold it for about 40 seconds, 50 seconds, and then you do it the other side. And you don't want to hurt yourself, but what it does is it sends a trigger to your parasympathetic nervous system and you just melt. You know, it is so, so beautiful. It triggers the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nervous system and you just release and it's just beautiful, it's delicious. And it's those kinds of moments that you can get when you're tapping into meditation and breath work that is so rich and delicious. So we talked about body scans. There's also mantras and you can use mala beads. That, of course, often comes from different cultures and different religions, but anyone can use mala beads. Anyone can adopt that for themselves. I personally have prayed the mala beads with just a mantra. I've not had a mantra, I've used the mala beads. I've been focusing on my breath. I've done breath work meditations with the mala beads in silence and with music. I've prayed to Mother Mary with the mala beads before with a rosary. And that has been really, really powerful and transformative as well over the years. I grew up in a Church of England church and then in a Baptist church. So Catholicism wasn't really something that I grew up with. But I did have friends who were Catholic and I mean, to be honest, Mother Mary I felt was always there along with Jesus so I always recognized Mary even though maybe she wasn't recognized within the church that I grew up in I always had the feeling of Mother Mary watching over me and Jesus as well you know I've talked about Jesus in other videos that I had a connection to Jesus and prayer can be meditative as well especially if you're taking your time with that prayer is also something in itself which we're not gonna <laughs> talk loads about otherwise we'll be here for hours and then of course as I've mentioned walking meditations it's just about choosing to focus on something so whether that's your breath or your feet as you walk or just a free meditation where you're noticing the plants the animals the nature around around you and the changes, perhaps a seasonal meditative walk, which is really beautiful. And then of course you can find a little patch to sit on, you can do grounding meditations, and that's just so, so beautiful. As I mentioned, of course, there's Zen meditation, Taoist meditation, Kundalini meditation, Chakra meditation. There's monastic kinds of meditation as well by Christian monks that involves prayer, Sufi meditation. Within the Kabbalah as well, there's different types of meditation there's visualizations of course and journey work which I love visualizations can be really really beautiful and that can then lead to astral work and journey work on the astral I would like to do a video on this but I do consider 
astral travel and astral projection to be slightly different in themselves, slightly different techniques, but essentially it is your mind that is projecting you somewhere. I do also believe that there are places on the astral that everyone can go to, and I think Jasmine Ambrosia's Book of Witch Flight is a great book exploring some of these areas, especially the hallowed woods. I always had a woodland that I would go to from quite a young age on the astral, but also there's a beach I go to regularly on the astral, and there's also an ocean. So there is a deep dark ocean that I have found myself on so many nights, slipping into a trance state and then I'm on an ocean, I'm either on the ocean or I'm viewing the ocean. But it's very strange, it's like almost, I feel like I've seen it a thousand times and I've been there a thousand times. It's like a bed on an ocean or you're just floating on the ocean and it's dark, it's really, really deep, deep, deep dark. It's a deep, deep ocean and I believe that is a collective astral place that we can visit, just like the hallowed woods. And some people might not call it the hallowed woods, but it's there and it's potent, it's powerful. And some people call it the witch woods. Meeting the witch father or the devil, you know, old horny, the horned one, the horned god, Kanunos, Pan, you know, these deities that are often kind of brought together as sort of thought of as similar kinds of deities. And some soft polytheists may say that they're aspects of the same deities. Other harder polytheists like me might say, you know, they're separate entities, but they all have something kind of in common that means, you know, that different cultures were tapping into them at different times, you know. I'm going off on so many tangents here because this is something I'm so passionate about. There's also a technique of transcendental meditation which involves mantras. Again, with grounding and centering you can do different nature meditations, nature walks as I've talked about. And visualisation meditations can be either self-guided, so for people who have more experience you can guide yourself, you can either record yourself and then play that back or you know the path and you get into the path and then you're in it and you experience what you experience. So I often will guide myself without my voice. I don't, haven't got a recording that I use at the moment. I have in the past recorded myself and used that, but at the moment I don't have one that I use. But you can do that. You can also record meditations from books yourself and then obviously play them back or you can purchase meditations as well on iTunes. Of course, with audiobooks as well, you get the meditations read out to you, so that's helpful. Then there's music as well, like vibrational music that you can get on iTunes. And of course, you can get a lot of that for free on YouTube too. There are also some incredible apps, including Aura, of course, which we've mentioned. So the bit that I'm really excited about now is some techniques for supporting your meditation with breath work. So we're gonna be talking about specific breath work techniques now. And and these are some of my favorites. So the most basic form of breath work is diaphragmatic breath work. In occult circles, I've also seen this referred to as vase breathing or vase breathing, and Jason Miller talks about this in his books. And this is basically how to breathe. So it's breathing 101, <laughs> which everyone needs to learn how to do. I learned this when I was quite small because I did acting and singing and dancing, and you kind of need to know how to breathe properly if you're singing and you're acting and you're dancing. So you want to be breathing from your belly, but specifically with your diaphragm. So you want to be in a place either sitting or lying down where you can put your hand to your belly, sort of where your diaphragm is, which is just below your ribs, a hand on your chest and a hand on your belly where your diaphragm is, just underneath your ribs. So you want to inhale deeply through your nose and feel your belly as it expands and your chest shouldn't rise like this. If you're breathing in, you're breathing in through your nose and then you can release it through your mouth or through your nose either, but then when you release it, then your belly will contract and come back in. And you don't want to be breathing the other way. <gasps> so you want to ensure that you are breathing in through your nose, your belly is coming out, and as you release, your belly then contracts and goes back in. What you don't want is for your chest to be rising when you're breathing in like this. <sighs> That's not what you want. That is basically how so many people breathe because we're stressed <laughs> and it's modern day living for you. So learning how to breathe is a basic number one tool. So that is an excellent technique if you are new to this just to begin doing that. And I would suggest that you try and breathe in for three seconds to start with through the nose and then hold it for two seconds and then ooh, out 
through your mouth. And that is the easiest way to breathe and it's the healthiest way to breathe. And you'll find that if you breathe like that, 10 breaths or so, you will feel so much better than you did before. And as well, if you can try to lengthen your breath, now this is not possible for some people, I know. So really just breathing in for three seconds and releasing for six seconds, or if that's too challenging, breathing in for two seconds, releasing for four seconds. But if you can lengthen your breath as you breathe out, that is really, really powerful and really, really potent and transformative. A somatic breath technique that I absolutely love does require you to have a little bit more lung capacity, so it's slightly more advanced. But if you can, breathe in through your nose until you can't breathe in anymore. And then you hold it for a few seconds, however many you can manage, three or four, if you can manage that. And then you release it until there's nothing else to release. Now obviously I didn't just do that because I'm talking to you, but what you want to be able to do is to release it so much that you are emptying your body. Almost imagine yourself like a Coke bottle. This is what I learned when I was younger, singing. You imagine yourself like a Coke bottle. And this I think is a variation on the visualization of a vase if you're doing vase breathing, but it's essentially the same thing. Filling from the bottom up. Ooh. And releasing and even when you think that there's nothing left you keep going I'll often feel this little like oh like little shake almost when that's like the last little bit it's like oh and that's it and if you do that for three four rounds you're again gonna trigger the vagus nerve trigger that parasympathetic nervous system and it's going to really really support you to relax the body and de-stress basically so it sends a message to the body to say you're safe really so it understands that you don't need to go into fight or flight which so often we do and we panic and we breathe <gasps> like this all the time you know I was always told that I flapped like <gasps> panicked so you know these are breathwork techniques that I have loved and cherished and utilized throughout my life because I naturally was kind of that kid that was quite anxious and that would flap especially when performances happened apparently <laughs> they call me the flapper a technique that I absolutely loved when I was in labor was the diaphragmatic breath but lengthening it as much as I could so I played with it so I was breathing in for six and then releasing to 12 and it really really helped because lengthening it that much and then you just find your lung capacity gets stronger and so for some people this won't be the case so it's really just go with what works for you I also have a technique that I use with my kids. Sometimes if they're, you know, if they're gone past it, sometimes it's too late, especially with my daughter being on the spectrum. But with my son, it definitely works. If they are worked up in a tiz, you can get them to blow on you. So if you're in front of them and you get them to just blow on you, it will encourage them to breathe in naturally because we know how to breathe naturally. It's just that with life, we get stressed and then we forget how to breathe. So getting them back into that so they're there. It's really, really powerful. And you can even get them to still does the same thing. It's not quite as nice for you if you're being spat on, but it's fun for them. A technique I absolutely love to lean into, especially for sleep, is the 478 breath and I started using this in my 20s when I had some insomnia and it's supposed to just send you straight off to sleep. It's a pranayama technique that I think they use in the military to help people to fall asleep, especially if they've been through trauma. So essentially you breathe in through your nose to a count of four, you hold to a count of seven and then you release slowly to a count of eight. And then you repeat the cycle for as many rounds as you need. And I used to do this to drift off to sleep essentially. And it works, it's beautiful, I love it. And I utilize this with meditations as well. I think it's a really, really lovely way to get in. And it's just a nice pattern. And I think that finding one that works for you is really, really great. So a lot of magical folk that I know also love the box breath technique. I think it's very popular. I've seen it referenced in a number of books as well. It's also called square breathing. You inhale for a count of four, you hold for a count of four, and then you exhale for a count of four. So it's literally, it's quite easy to remember because of that. So you and then hold again. So inhale, hold, exhale, hold, and it's all for four. So it's quite easy. And I think you can find videos of these on YouTube where it actually draws a square 
but you can visualize the square in front of you. And that's really, really helpful to support with visualization techniques as well. So then there are other breathing techniques I know from different yoga classes, but ones that I'm not that keen on. There's something called ocean breathing, where you sort of make a funny noise in your throat that I don't particularly like. Yeah, I never really got into that, but you, you create a noise, like a noise at the back of your throat as you're breathing out but I don't tend to enjoy that so much. But Another technique that I really do enjoy that I forgot to mention within yogic practices is the breath of fire or fire breathing. This technique is a form of pranayama and it's utilized commonly within kundalini yoga. The breath of fire is a breathing technique within which you inhale through your nose, utilizing the diaphragm and allow your belly to expand and you exhale rapidly through the nostrils with a staccato breath that repeats until you have fully released the breath. I do like to use the alternate nostril breath work So this technique isn't great if you have a cold or flu or anything like that, or if you're a bit nasally, but it can actually help to unblock the passageways in a weird way, but it's a bit gross sometimes. <laughs> but it, it can be good. I mean, I think I'm more likely to utilize a breath like that within yogic practices because it feels more aligned. My favorite techniques are definitely just the diaphragmatic breath and lengthening the breath and then the 478 technique are my favorites in addition to the somatic exercises and breath work where you inhale to your full capacity and then release to full release, you know, so there's nothing left. And I really, really noticed that triggering my parasympathetic nervous system, helping you to get all the benefits from it, really. So there are so many benefits, of course, as we talked about stress reduction and helping with anxiety and mindfulness. There's this connection to mind-body, which is so, so powerful and potent, and of course, really, really important for things like yoga, and then that connection to the divine as well. It also really, really supports with things like chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic pain. And, you know, I've since suffering more with those, I've noticed how these techniques actually do support me with what I'm experiencing. I think it helps to cultivate a sense of heart-centeredness and compassion, supporting causes, activism, environmental advocacy, etc. All of these things kind of go hand in hand, really. And you'll notice as you deepen into communities where these techniques and practices are popular, these are the kinds of people that you will be meeting. And that's really, really beautiful as well. There's self-realization, self-actualization, self-love, self-care, but then there's also aspects of divinity to it and understanding the wholeness as well as the divinity being within you you know that non-duality aspect of it as well I do want to talk about probably one of the biggest challenges and that is that busy mind chatter monkey mind type scenario that everyone will experience but then also the other side of it the flip side of it for witches and pagans and magical folks is this desire to be able to focus and strengthen our abilities an ability to focus is really really important for instance Matt Oren's book Psychic Witch I've heard a lot of people talk about how that initial breathwork practice near the start of the book, that counting back practice is really, really challenging for a lot of people because it's impossible for the mind not to wander. It's not necessarily that things won't come in, but it's just not holding on to them. So I like to think of them like clouds that just pass by, but you could think of it like a car that's driving by or, you know, it's just something that comes along. And I feel as well that one thing that I'm quite prone to as an anxious person, as someone who suffered with depression and OCD, is thoughts and understanding that those thoughts aren't me. So understanding that if a thought comes in, it doesn't mean it's what I want or what I am going to do or, you know, it's not a reflection of me. It's not me. It's just a thought, it's a passing thought, and I can allow it to pass me by. And so that's where these techniques can really, really support. So it's not necessarily that your mind has to be completely empty while you're counting back in order for you to be able to practice psychic 
witchery. That's not really the point of it, at least that's not what I got from it. Now, I might be corrected by some people, but I have found a lot of success practicing and tapping into my psychic abilities, my innate psychic abilities. I do have clairvoyance. I see things in my mind's eye. I have also seen some things with my real eyes. I have seen some things, mostly my third eye. I do see things. I see colours. I see shapes. I see figures, I see faces all the time, quite frequently. And I also have clairaudience, clairsentience, just having a sense of something and also clairknowing. Sometimes I'll just be like, I know that something is happening with these people, something's going on with this, and then a couple of hours later something will come and something's gone on, you know, and I'll just have a sense of it. And it's something that everyone experiences. It's not that some people are just naturally really, really gifted in these areas. A lot of people are really gifted in these areas, but it's whether you choose to kind of foster and cultivate these abilities really is what's important. And even if someone doesn't naturally think they have got those abilities, they probably do because everybody does. And I believe everybody has the capacity to be incredibly psychic and to be incredibly magical. And I believe that some people just naturally are very inherently psychic and very very magical and then other people are full of untapped potential it's just however much you want to engage with these practices to support you I would argue as well that any spell that you are working on is going to be strengthened manifold by any breathwork techniques or any meditation that you are engaging with whether that's a walking meditation or sitting in a lotus pose, you know, with various mudras, or however it is, body scans, whatever, whether you practice Reiki, whether you practice yoga, whether you do lying down visualizations and meditations, whether you like to pop into a tarot card, or whether you like path work with the Kabbalah, like whatever it is that you are engaging with that is meditative, there are many, many ways to meditate, and the sort of traditional understanding of it, that you're sitting, breathing, with nothing going through your mind is just kind of one small fractal of it. I mean, personally for me, I do like to lie down because that is the easiest way that I find that I can meditate. And I think now is a good time to maybe talk about some of the other challenges that we might have personally. So for me, in terms of my neck, my back, and then physical pain, I find that lying down, I tend to get a better meditation and I tend to be able to slip more into trance states and then astral travel from there. I tend to be more successful in those instances because otherwise I don't feel comfortable. I get to a point where I just, mm, and that is not helpful. I also have a mask that I like to put on, especially because it if I'm meditating in the day, there's usually a lot of light coming through. I live in a rural area, but there's also a lot of houses around here. So it's kind of like a little neighborhood. And there are a lot of children, a lot of families, and there's a park right opposite the road. I know that it's quite likely there'll be a crying or a laughing child throughout my meditation. I also know that because of my own things that have happened in my life, my own experiences, that is quite a triggering sound for me. I know where it's gonna take me. So I already have that awareness kind of pre-programmed into any meditation meditations that I'm doing. So if it does come up, it's medicine, essentially. And you can allow any sounds. So when we first moved here, there are a lot of construction works, noises going on. And I set the intention that those would feed into wherever I was in the meditation. And it would be part of that. Now, I know it can be distracting. But in the past, I have actually utilized those moldable earplugs. But after having kids, I stopped using those just because it was important for me to be able to hear. But you can go that way if it helps. These are the things that you have to kind of do if you live in a built up area, you just sort of have to be able to work around these things. It reminds me a little bit of the kind of caveat I have for whenever I cast a circle, if I'm doing something more ceremonial than normal and I cast a circle in a similar way that I would allow myself to kind of unzip a space to slip out if I've forgotten something and then zip it back up again. I allow for cats, dogs and children to come in and out. I mean, usually they don't now, but when they were younger, it might happen that a child would need me. And so I allow for that in my spaces and just setting the intention because they are part of me. They are part of my home and they are also part of my magic. So it makes sense that they are already kind of pre-programmed into the circle space. So I think of it a little bit like that. It's kind of whatever you need with your life, 
being able to kind of pre-program your meditations ahead of time with intentions. So that's another way as well, you can set intentions ahead of time, either written down or just in your mind. And a Sankalpa is a kind of intention for Yoga Nidra that we use, that's really beautiful as well. So there are lots of ways that you can support yourself to get in if things are challenging. Another way that I used to love meditating was breastfeeding meditations. So when my kids were little I would breastfeed but you know you can be sitting there either looking at your phone or watching TV or I had a friend who used to read, she read tons of novels. I couldn't do that because it just, yeah. So I was either on my phone or watching TV and I was just like I could meditate in this time and it was like oh my gosh brainwaves and it's such a it's a really heart opening thing to breastfeed anyway as it is your own child and feeling that closeness and that skin on skin is so important when you're a new mum and if you've had kids of your own you'll know that is just something that is talked about a lot in motherhood and in maternity so having a meditative practice while you have a baby suckling is really really beautiful it's a really really lovely experience and I would never allow myself to slip into sort of a trance state too far you know obviously you do have an altered state of consciousness to some extent when you're breathing but it was always just very very simple breath work that I would do and closing my eyes you can also do this with like tea and coffee I'm sure that many of you program your tea you set intentions with your tea and coffee and drinks you know cacao is a ritual in itself I don't take ceremonial cacao at home but I have attended rituals cacao ceremonies but at home I do just drink organic cacao with oat milk and I absolutely love it and I treat it like a sacred ritual Another thing that I would do as well when my kids were little was evening meditation. So I have also utilized hypnosis a lot. I have actually seen a professional hypnotist previously and I've also taken a hypnobirthing course when I was pregnant. So hypnosis tracks a lot for getting to sleep and there are loads of these on Aura as well. But additionally, I would find that if I wasn't able to meditate in the morning and then if I wasn't able to find the time in the day, if I meditated before bed, it wasn't quite the same, but I still pretty much got the benefits out of it. So if you can only meditate at night when everyone else is in bed, do that. Just get it in. And whether or not you fall asleep afterwards, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's probably likely that you're going to be like, okay, so I'm all ready for bed. I'm going to do my meditation and then I'm going to go to sleep. And whether or not you're doing your meditation, then you sleep in the same place. I mean, some people would say your meditation spot should not be your bed. I like having my meditation spot in my bed. So I do that, but you do you. Some people will have a cushion and a pillow. I do actually have a little spot where I do do seated meditations, but that's in front of my Lilith altar. So that's much more of a kind of when I'm engaging with Lilith and prayers, that's more of a prayer spot. But I do meditate there occasionally if I feel that I can sit. But I like to lie down mostly with my meditations unless I'm doing a walking meditation. I've also talked about candle gazing. Candle gazing is such a great technique for when you're tired and when you don't want to meditate. It's just really nice to light a candle and sit and just watch the flame and you can slip into an altered state of consciousness really really easily that way as well. So there are other ways to meditate as well. You can tap into kind of personal sensual pleasures without saying too much and getting demonetized. You can tap into meditative breath work in that way as well and of course that is you know along the lines of tantra and you know you can get into all kinds of magic with that as well which I have talked about a little bit because I was doing a lot of deep diving into sex magic a number of years ago and there are some videos of me talking about some books that I was reading at the time. So there are so many ways to go with this. There's a lot of history, there's a lot of context, there's a lot of different cultural types of meditations and types of breath work and cultural appropriation is really important to be aware of as well you know and you can practice whatever works for you at home but as long as you're not you know learning a Vedic meditation practice on YouTube and then selling it in a course for thousands of pounds I think that you're okay you know or claiming to be a shaman you know that kind of thing that's where we get really into difficult waters but there are practices that are there and you know they are open practices meditation breath work is an open practice maybe certain types of meditations are held within closed practices but for the most part the meditation that you're going to learn about here and on other channels and in most books that you will access they are going to be appropriate for you to practice so find what works for you find what you enjoy and deepen into it and you'll get yourself into a spot where 
you find it really, really delicious, trust me. If this is all new for you, just follow some of the techniques I've shared, some of the breath work that I have said that I really have enjoyed, you know, try out a few things. You might find there's something you really, really love, stick with it. If you miss a day, don't worry, don't stress, just pick it up the next day or whenever you can. This could never be a comprehensive video, but I hope that it serves in some way to help you to understand that it's not that scary and that anyone can do it and that absolutely this will transform your practice as well as your life if you can commit to a little bit of breath work even if it's not a five minute meditation like a five minute meditation once a day would be amazing but if it's not that then just 10 rounds of deep breaths whenever you can that diaphragmatic breathing remember that i will send you away with some homework to take three deep breaths after this video. I hope that you've enjoyed this. If you have any questions at all for me, let me know below. I would love to hear what works for you in your practice. Is there a particular style of meditation or breath work that you love to do? Let me know in the comments box, I'd love to hear. If you enjoyed the video, please like it, share with anyone who you think will also enjoy it, and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, you can support me on Instagram. I have a Patreon page where you can support me and access extra perks. I also have a TikTok page which is not really in use at the moment but there is a lot of content on there from previously. You can also use the super thanks below, there's also a buy me coffee page and a direct PayPal link as well if you want to support me. Thank you so much again for joining me and thank you to Aura for partnering with me for this video. Don't forget to click my link below for a free trial and 25% off your subscription to the Aura app. I hope that you enjoy and if you made it all the way to the end of the video leave me a little like yogic breath meditation emoji if you can. Um, Thank you again for joining me. I hope you stay well and safe and I look forward to seeing you again in another video really soon. Take care. Mwah. Many blessings.